good afternoon. I have been asked by several people uh, how to make sense of the events in our current day, our current time, at these times, with the end times, or what the Bible says is you know, the consummation of creation and redemption, and God bringing everything to an end. And of course, the question comes up, are we in the last days? I've seen things that you have, I'm sure, about uh, the Antichrist on the internet, uh, such as whether the vaccine has a chip in it or whether the vaccine itself is the mark of the beast, and whether or not I even saw uh, things like COVID, uh, or COVID-19, if you take the letters and use a certain uh, spelling system or numbering system, it becomes 666. Now, of course, that's absurd because how could a disease be the mark of the beast? How could even a vaccine, which could be a very bad idea, uh, don't get me wrong, or a microchip is not even fulfilling what the book of Revelation talks about as the mark of the beast. And I will get to that. This, this little series, I hope I will be able to answer your questions, and I hope you'll be able to send those questions to me, and uh, I can address them individually. But I want to give you a quick history lesson. The topic really, the, the large topic here is eschatology, which is one of those words that you don't use in everyday language, and I don't blame you, but it simply means as a study of the final things, of the last things. And we often think of it as this, that we live our lives until Jesus returns or we die, and when we die, that's our last thing. Uh, Jesus returns and there's the rapture, followed by, or in the middle of, or at the end of the seven-year tribulation and all these things, if we just simply hang on there, we will understand or we'll experience uh, eschatology, the end of it. Biblical eschatology, though, actually begins in Genesis, uh, Genesis 3, when God said, uh, I will put my foot, or my, my foot will crush, uh, sorry, I'm uh, obviously I'm living here. The, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. That's eschatology, okay? And as you go through all the biblical history, it's going towards a goal. So eschatology is all through the Bible. The end times are all through the Bible. But we have a unique problem here in the Western church, Western Christianity, and as we've exported Western Christianity as missionaries, doing a great task of bringing people into the gospel, bringing people into the kingdom. But we have been taught for about 200 years since the foundation of dispensationalism, which is Darby, and you may not, not have heard of him, but you probably have heard of the Schofield Reference Bible and other teachers who teach dispensationalism, which is something that we, the church has not really believed except in the last 200 years. And what it means is, essentially, this world is a complete wipeout, a complete washout. There's nothing in this world we should be concerned about. We should simply be concerned about our own personal piety. Uh, we want to evangelize, and we want to bring people into the gospel, into receiving Jesus and following him, but it does not have much impact on how we live our lives. We live our lives ethically, but it doesn't have much impact. The gospel doesn't have much impact, say, if you are a, a nurse or an attorney or a cabinet maker or an electrician or a plumber, how are you a Christian in those things? Are those things Christian things? Martin Luther brought back the idea of Christian vocation, that a vocation was your calling, and the calling of a pastor is no higher or no lower than the calling of a shoemaker or a barber. And so we need to re recapture that idea and turn away from the idea uh, that we've had so uh, seen so much in popular Christian movies like the Left Behind series, uh, where suddenly all the Christians are gone and then there's this terrible tribulation. And the speculation that goes on through this is massive and extensive. For instance, if you want to show me from the Bible where the Bible says there's a seven-year tribulation period, send an email to me. 
and tell me where it says that. Because if you're like many Christians, you think, well, yes, there's a seven-year tribulation coming. Is this, is this the start of it? Is Donald Trump the Antichrist? Or is Joe Biden the Antichrist? Or, or, or Brian Mulroney? Or, well, that's a day in me. Uh, is uh, Justin Trudeau the Antichrist? You know, Martin Luther believed the Pope was the Antichrist. And everyone believed that Hitler was the Antichrist or Mussolini or some other character, and all through history you have these things that really just embarrass the church. And they we make these predictions and these declarations, forgetting that the word Antichrist only occurs in the letters of John, not even in the revelation of John, and speak of those who deny Christ, the Antichrist. And John said they are already present in his day. So I want to walk us through what the end is about. And I want us to realize that God has a plan for this earth. We do not simply say this world does not matter and we're just going to squeeze through it. And I'll tell you why it's really important. If you care about your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren's salvation, we must not assume that if the world is going to hell on earth while we're here, that they will hear the gospel and they will be able to, uh, they will heed the gospel and they will become disciples. We are not sure of that. In the 1950s and 60s and 70s, it was much more likely because the culture was friendlier to the gospel that you could see your children become Christian. But that is not a given in the same way it was then. Culturally, we are on the outside. And yet the culture belongs to Jesus. So I want to make several things really clear that are Belief in the end times, anything about that has to stand on the doctrine that Jesus is Lord of all creation. He is Lord of everything, not just some things. He's not simply Lord of the church. He is Lord of parliament and Congress and every ruler on earth. He is Lord over the communist China. He's Lord over Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq. He's Lord over Nigeria. And those are some things we have to keep in mind. If you've ever said or heard say that worrying about this world is similar to shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic, presumably after it hit the bird, and in other words, futile, then you are thinking like a dispensationalist, like a pietist is really the word. And that pietism is how the church stood by when Adolf Hitler came to power and the church did nothing and said nothing. Today we have a church that's much more vocal, which I appreciate, and not everything we say is helpful. But we need to keep in mind that God is concerned about the hearts and souls of every parliamentarian. And when a man or woman in power becomes a Christian, then that man or woman has an obligation to execute their office as a Christian. And those who are not Christian have an obligation to obey the law of God, even if they deny the law of God. Everything that draws breath, everyone that is alive, is obligated to the law of God and will be judged that way. Those are some basic things, and I'll return to those themes as we go through this, but I want to start with some things that are kind of foundational. When I was very young, and I was uh, really into the whole eschatology thing, but I didn't understand it because really the way it's presented is very hard to understand from a, a sound Bible reading way. If you read the Bible carefully or simply, you won't get a seven-year tribulation ever. If you, you can look for it, you won't find it. It has to be done with some kind of calculus. Uh, and I'll show you what that is. Or figure, or guessing what uh, the mark of the beast is going to be. You know, 666 and what that means. I will get into that. But I want to look at just a few passages of scripture today that will maybe help us uh, to understand that. So our scripture passages, and, and you think, well, Revelation is where everything's at, right? Well, no, you need to look at Daniel, Ezekiel, and especially Matthew, or well, Luke as well, but Matthew is very helpful. Matthew uh, 23, 24, and 25. And I don't like to take you away from your Bibles. So I want you to look these, well, we'll look up a couple of these passages, but I'm not going to simply read Matthew 24 to you. That's a, that's a long passage. But I want to highlight something to you 
uh, for you today, and then we'll move on from here. If you have any trouble hearing this, or this isn't a very clear recording, please let me know. I'm using some new equipment, and I depend on feedback on how this is going. If I'm talking too fast, if I look too funny, uh, anything like that, I, I could use your help with that, okay? So our scriptures, first of all, is Matthew 23, 36, ESV, English Standard Version. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, who's that talking to? If you remember Matthew, Matthew has at the beginning of chapter 5, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the pure in heart, etc., blessed are the peacemakers, blessed ours, and you're blessed as disciples. Near the end of the book, he counters that, Jesus counters that with woes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And he has quite a list in chapter 23. Woe to you at all these things. There's actually, there's seven woes starting in chapter 23 of Matthew. You do very well to read those. But when you get to the end of it, the very last verse of chapter 23, which is what we're looking at, Matthew 23, verse 36, says, Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, biblically, a generation is about 40 years. Because it gives time, uh, it's a time from, say, a child is born to where the child grows up and starts a family, and to where that family grows up and that child can become a grandparent generally 40 years. Uh, things are a little more compact time-wise. It's not all that odd to see a, a grandparent in their 30s today. It was very common at that time. So a generation is about 40 years. Now, so Jesus is talking to people who have rejected him, people who have said, we are your enemy and we will crucify you. We will get rid of you. And there's the scribes and the Pharisees and he called them hypocrites. Scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. And then all these curses upon them. And he says, this will happen, he says, upon this generation. In other words, the people standing there now, within about 40 years. When did Jesus say this? Well, we don't have an exact calendar, but we know that he was crucified around 33 AD. Okay, so you're looking at maybe 73 AD. Keep that day in mind. Now, I'm going to leave it for you to read all of Matthew 24 on your own. Uh, these little talks will be less helpful if you're not reading uh, the passage, but the next uh, passage then, the next passage, look at the end of Matthew 24, 34. Not all the way through Matthew 24, but uh, getting there. Matthew 24, verse 34 says this, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So now, the things that happen is Matthew 24, 1 to Matthew 20, uh, 23, or 24, Matthew 24, verse 30. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 33. Okay, so he talks about many things. Chapter 24, verse 1 through chapter 24, verse 33. He says, all these things will happen in this generation. This generation will not pass away. And he's again speaking to people standing there. So the, the curses upon the Pharisees, the woe upon the Pharisees and scribes and the hypocrites will come in their lifetime, or at least in their children's lifetime. And the events of chapter 24. Now the issue here is whenever you hear about the Great Tribulation, which is supposedly off now 2,000 years from the time Jesus said this, Jesus says the things in this passage, and we're going to open that up on our next session, the things in this passage are going to happen in a generation. Now, historically, around 70 AD, that's within a generation, the Roman Empire came against Jerusalem. I believe it was General Titus, surrounded Jerusalem and put siege works against Jerusalem. And after about, I think maybe six years, the city of Jerusalem was raised to the ground, destroyed. All that's left of the temple today is the Wailing Wall that's still there in Jerusalem. That's the foundation wall, it's not actually a wall of the temple. Completely destroyed, as Jesus said would happen. Now here's why 
it gets really important. R.C. Sproul has a really good book called The End Times According to Jesus, and it's a Kindle Amazon book if you want to get it. It's not an expensive book. A really good book, and he brings up something. In the 19th century is when much of Protestant liberalism came about to where it became evident that we no longer believe the Bible in our mainline churches, which includes Lutheran, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, uh, almost all mainline churches have rejected scripture. And we're still on that roll today, in one way or another. And one of the men that that advanced this idea is Albert Schweitzer, famous theologian, organist, a uh, very well-known theologian in the 19th century. And what Albert Schweitzer said was that Jesus was absolutely wrong about the end of the world, because he said it was going to happen. And at the time Schweitzer was talking, many Christians were saying, yes, this is off in the future in a few thousand years. Well, it doesn't say it's off in the future in a few thousand years. It says in this generation, in fact, it's like bookends, isn't it? At the end of when he speaks to the Pharisees, and at the end of the all of the discourse where he lays out what's going to happen to them, this generation. And so what R.C. Sproul brings up very well is that Schweitzer got the wrong information. <laughs> Jesus was exactly right. And he's predicted it, and that actually gives us a very good reason to believe the scriptures on this. So it's not like, oh, well, Jesus was wrong. And there's many theologians today, uh, many uh, so you know, Bible scholars will say, well, Jesus and Paul got the end times wrong. And of course, if they got that wrong, what else have they gotten wrong? That's the question. See, once you've removed a firm belief in biblical truth and in the teaching and in the veracity of Scripture, once you remove that, it's easy to remove anything you want. And it was taught to me very early when I was studying is that you always want to remove the truth or the authority from whatever claims to have authority over us. So if you can doubt what has authority over you, then you can dismiss it, which is really what Satan was doing in the garden, correct? Uh, he was trying to uh, go that route by asking Eve, did God say? So did Jesus say the end of the world would come in his lifetime, or did Jesus say something else was going to happen in his lifetime? Is Matthew 24 about the end of this planet, about everything that we know in normal life or is there something else that was going to happen and i'm arguing for the something else that was something that was absolutely going to happen and absolutely did happen and gives us great cause and reason to believe and to trust in the scriptures again so i want to stop that here i will prepare another talk later in the week if there's any demand for this at all and when I do that, I, I am going to assume that you've read through Matthew 24, because I will be reading through Matthew 24. And you're going to read that, and you're going to say, how could that have happened already? Okay? How could that have been fulfilled? And I hope I can give you an adequate answer. Because I think an inadequate answer is to say, well, it's going to happen someday. Well, maybe. But it sort of makes a mess out of how the Bible interprets itself and how we understand that interpretation. So, leaving this with you, it's possible that the worst idea ever come, uh, some very horrible ideas are coming upon us, uh, whether it be vaccines that are good or bad, uh, whether it be uh, how we deal with lockdowns and things like that. And uh, it's, I think, pretty obvious that there is a definite satanic antichrist spirit uh, working in the world today to destroy the church and destroy Christianity. But we have to remember that the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. And we need to maybe forget that uh, we're not in a fortress mentality, but we are in an advancing uh, position to where we are at war with spiritual forces. And that war does not uh, look like the movie The Exorcist or something like that. It means that there's evil afoot. And as Christians, we need to understand what God's will is at this time and understand how to live as Christian citizens and how to live as citizens on earth. 
and abandoning the whole world to the devil at this time is not the uh, helpful way to accomplish that. So if you want to contact me, uh, you're going to see this on YouTube, and I will put my email address on that. You can also look at my webpage, which will be links to this and other things, at scottljacobson.com. And you're, you're guaranteed to spell that wrong. So I'll do it for you. Scott is S-C-O-T-T, -T -T L, middle initial, Jacobson. And here's where the part people get wrong. J-A-C-O-B-S-E-N. Jacobson, not Jacobson. <laughs> okay, they sound the same. Anyway, scottljacobson.com. I will have an uh, attempt to get some more material here to you uh, in the near future. Uh, goodbye and God bless.